In today's episode, I am chatting with my friend, Laurie Palau, host of the podcast, This Organized Life, and the creator of a partner program for professional organizers through her business, Simply Be Organized. So Laurie and I are chatting all about podcasting and about what she offers for professional organizers and where she sees herself going as an entrepreneur in this industry. You're listening to the Pro Organizer Studio Podcast with Jen Obermeyer. Thank you for joining in. Jen makes it her mission to broaden the horizons of savvy businesswomen in the organizing industry by instilling confidence and inspiring authenticity. She is a devoted business coach and founder of the Inspired Organizer Program. Each week, you'll gain new insight into strategies designed specifically for professional organizers. And now, let's get started. Welcome back to the Pro Organizer Studio podcast. It's Jen Obermeyer, and I'm so excited today to have Laurie Palau on with us. And Laurie is my friend, of course, and she is the host of the podcast, which you probably already know and love, called This Organized Life. Wonderful to have you here, Laurie. Welcome. Thank you so much. So this is, as you know, it's a brand new podcast and you've been podcasting for a while. I know. I'm really excited. I can't even tell you when I saw that you were starting a podcast, I like literally think I did a little jump up and down in my house. <laughs> <laughs> I need, I need all the tips and advice. Um, and you know, we, you reach, you reach professional organizers all over the world with yours as well. So let me just start. First question first. What do you think is something interesting about yourself that your listeners don't even know about you yet? Hmm. Okay. Um, I don't know if I've ever been asked that question. Um, You're such an open book. Already. I know. I am. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm trying to think of something that people don't know about me. They know that I hate laundry. Um, mm. They know that um, I don't, I'm just trying to think what's a big, I'm really afraid of heights. That's a big thing. I hate roller oh. coasters, mm. spies. Actually, my family banned me from going to amusement parks with them because I, they said I'm just like a buzzkill. So I'm You're not terrible. even allowed to go with them <laughs> anymore. It's a true story. That's hilarious. So when you started the uh, This Organized Life podcast and you started getting people listening to you from all over the world, which is a surreal experience, right? Totally. And, and they, and they, what did they say? Did they say, Laurie, I need you to come organize my house and I live in, you know, Isn't California. It, like what, what happened? Like okay. what started happening when you started podcasting? Okay. So this is really the funny story. This is the truth. I, I mean it sincerely. So when I started the podcast, I really, I was, I felt I was late to the podcast game, right? Like there were people that had been listening and doing podcasting for years. And I was like, I don't really understand it, but somebody told me I should do it. And I was like, oh, I don't have to do video. Perfect. Because mm. I'm much rather be behind a podcast bike. Um, and I guess at the time I just thought it would be a nice compliment to blogging. Cause I'm really I like to think of myself more as a writer and then doing video. And I like sharing my content just through kind of words and, and teaching in that modality. So I thought this would just be a nice extension of that. And in my mind, I thought the audience would really purely be people that needed organizing help. And that's kind of what my approach was when I first started the podcast was just talking to people like, Hey, you need help. I'm going to provide you a solution. And I think we still do that to some extent. But what I quickly found was that there was this whole other audience of people that were listening to my show that whether they were just entrepreneurs in another business and they just wanted business strategy and advice, or a lot of the people that were listening to our show were other professional organizers. And they were either saying, oh my gosh, I do that too. Or they were trying to learn some new tricks of the trade for that they could incorporate with their own business. So it really opened up this whole other world to me that I didn't even, wasn't even on my radar when I first started the podcast. And I think from there, it just really helped me grow and evolve my business um, in being able to not be so narrowly focused on the audience I was trying to reach. That's fascinating. So you and I have talked before about 
how what we really have in common is that we're pretty just obsessed with entrepreneurship and all, all of the ideas that we have that, you know, we, we don't have enough time to get to in a day. So how did you, you know, how did you decide that, you know, building the community around the podcast and then bringing other professional organizers into it? Like, how did you decide that that was a good idea? That was something that you had, you know, the bandwidth to give, to give time to with everything else that you had going on as an organizer? Well, I think it's a matter of kind of just being deliberate and making choices because we all have so many hours in a day. And I, I like to, you know, kind of revisit my goals and what I'm, what I'm trying, how I'm serving other people and how that relates to like what I want to be doing in the bigger picture. And when I first started my business 10 years ago, my goal at the time really was to be able to be rolling up my sleeves, hands on helping other people. And to some extent, I think that's still true. I just think that I'm, you know, I'm a doer by nature. Right? Mm-hmm. I don't, I'm an eight on the Enneagram. So I'm just all about doing, doing, doing. Mm-hmm. But what I found is that I really, I enjoy helping people. And I don't mean that to sound altruistic. That's not at all what I mean. But I feel like what, the value I can bring to people as I starting to feel a little bit more like a veteran in the organizing space is that there's a lot of people that are coming up the ranks that are really good at organizing, but lack some of the experience and the know-how on the business side of the business. And you and I have talked about this offline is that we really enjoy the business side of the business and not everybody does. And I think that that holds true for a lot of people that are entrepreneurs, whether they're a designer, a jewelry maker, you know, you could kind of fill in the blanks where you start your business out of a a passion for something that you're doing, but that doesn't necessarily translate into knowing that you know how to run a business and all the many hats that that requires you to wear. But I happen to enjoy that part. I like that part. I like the strategy of how do you build a business? How do you scale a business? What does that look like? And so I said, well, since I have this organic community of people through the podcast and and other modalities, why am I not leveraging those talents to help people in those areas that they're struggling? Just like 10 years ago, I help people organize their pantries and their closets. That makes so much sense. So what, how did that all come together? What did you create? So in 2017 was probably the biggest turning point year for me because I released the book and launched the podcast in the same year, which I don't recommend to anybody. It's like getting married and buying a house in the same year. Like <laughs> just don't do two big things, but I did it. Um, and so I started trying to figure out a way that I could organically connect the dots. And I knew that there were people out there in podcast land or social media world that lived in other areas outside of my geographic footprint that really needed accountability support from a professional organizer. I knew that there were other professional organizers kind of coming up the ranks that were trying to build out their brand. And I wanted to help them be able to kind of expand their footprint because I think that the stronger we are as a holistic community of organizers, the only, the better it is for our industry. So I want to be able to help them. And I like realized that I could be the conduit between those two points. So I created a partner program, which was a way for me to align other professional organizers and other geographic markets with my audience. Just like if you were to move here tomorrow and you said you needed a hairdresser, an OBGYN, or a painter, I would be the person that you would come to. This was no different. And that's really kind of how I saw it. And I said, you know, it's a collaborative group of people, not so different than Pro Organizer Studio, but just kind of focusing in on different areas um, and really complementing the, you know, the other areas. It's like, okay, great. I've built this website. I have an idea of what I want to be doing. I know what I want to be, um, you know, who my target audience is, but now what? How do I go out there and get them? How do I do these things? Um, how do I grow my, my presence out there? And so we're just kind of helping them navigate that because I know when I first started, it was a totally different landscape of the industry. And in some ways it was better and in some ways it was worse. But I just 
kind of had to figure it all out. There weren't as many resources out there. And so I wanted to be able to say, listen, if you can learn from some of my mistakes, then, you know, have at it. <laughs> and that's really how it, and it's just sort of grown and evolved from there. What's the, what's the best part of this so far? Or what's the most surprising aspect of growing your, your partner program? So I think, and that's a really good question. So I think for me, when I first came up with the idea and the concept, it was very, I, I felt like the responsibility of growing the program and cultivating it really fell on my shoulders. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I just felt like it's my responsibility. I'm bringing these people into this community and it's, my, and, and it's up to me and my team to continue to foster that relationship. And what I saw was, you know, we opened the door, but the organizers in our community of our partners have developed their own independent relationships and friendships and they support one another without me having to be the person leading it. So for example, we've got a few different podcasters. We have a few different partners who also have their own podcast. So they just willingly invite other members of the program to be on their show as guests. We, they guess blog on each other's you know, on their, each other's platforms. So there's so much social sharing and organic connection that's happened that I, that's not like part of the responsibility with my air quotes, you know, nobody's under any obligation to support the other organizers, but the people that we are bringing in are all of that same mindset. And so we really believe in the mindset of community over competition and not that I coined that phrase, but it's something that we use and we kind of all practice that and walk the walk and just seeing that organic growth of the 37 women who are in our program right now is just fabulous. It sounds like a vision that you had for a long time about building community beyond just who you could serve in home. Sounds like your dream really coming true, right? Well, 100%. And I think community in general is just super important. And I think, you know, we have two different types of community that can certainly intersect. I think we have our, our in-person community. How are you serving your community of the people that you do life with every day? And whether that's, you know, school friends, church friends, work friends, whatever it is, you know, that your neighbors, who who is your community of people? But then we would all be remiss to not acknowledge our online community of people. I mean, I think for as, you know, negative press a lot of times social media gets, I mean, I think there's so much good that can come of it. I mean, you and I became friends through social media and, and I value your, your friendship and your wisdom. And I think that there's so much that can come of it. And I think it's great when you can have your, your real life community intersect with your online community. Can I tell our audience a funny story? Yeah. Um, Laurie says we met through social media, which is true. But if you guys have listened to Laurie on her podcast before, you know she has a very blunt and straightforward style. <laughs> and the first time that Laurie and I ever talked was when she actually replied to uh, a mass email that I had sent out and she was asking to unsubscribe from it. <laughs> and I said, Oh no, I know who this girl is. I was like, Hey Laurie. Uh, but she, she, she was so funny. She said, um, she said, I want to stay on the email list. I just don't want this particular email series. And I was like, yep, that's her. <laughs> and I was like, all right. Was and that I, offensive? I, I didn't mean no, to No, not mean. at all. No, not at all. Like I, I appreciate it. I and I sure remember on, that. I remember I'm that sure you were on an unsubscribe spree that day, which I think probably a lot of organizers do that. And, but it was just so funny because I never, and my audience knows this, I never pass up an opportunity to meet somebody and network with somebody. And I just thought, oh, well, I've been meaning to reach out to her anyway. <laughs> and so I, I replied and I think like within a day we were on the phone with each other and then we've been, you know, buddies ever since. And totally. you're very special to me oh, because well, I likewise. feel like I can talk to you about almost anything when it comes to business and just this you know, this industry we're in and life and all that stuff. Well, thank you. And the feeling's mutual. And I think the, I think the key, I, I, I obviously can't speak for you, but for myself, I think there's just a mutual respect. You know, I respect everything that you've, 
built for yourself. I, you know, I know that you're a working mama, I'm a working mama. We both, you know, value building relationships and being able to, you know, realize that we don't have to hoard the information that we have or the knowledge that we have. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't diminish who we are. And the more that you can lift other people up, it really comes full circle. And so I see that in you and everything that you've built with Pro Organizer Studio and, and just in your own life. And, and so for me, those are the types of people that I want to surround myself with, you know, because I think we in general, and I mean that collectively, you know, it's our job to lead by example. And the more that you can lead by example, the, the more naturally people will follow suit. Well, I think we must be like sisters separated in some way because we are so much alike. <laughs> it's you're the scary. you're the younger sister though. I'm the, I'm like the old sister. <laughs> well, you're the cool sister for sure, and you're the one who'll say anything. Whereas I'm more like I got to get to know you before I'll say anything. You know. Anyway, our personalities are different, but we are we definitely have very similar. Um, interests and I don't know just you know I'm always thinking of the next big thing and it sounds like you are too always always trying always to yes yeah yeah all right so on that note let's go back and talk about um you you, said, you launched a podcast and a book in the same year that is exactly the kind of thing that I would do mm -hmm. I will tell you um I I have a book idea I'm not planning to do it this year which everybody in my life is like thank god because you've got I have way too much on my plate already but going back to, you know, you launched the book and what, what was that? I mean, what was that experience like for you? By the way, Hot Mess is Laurie's book and it's really good. And I say that and I want everybody to know that I have not read every organizing book out there. Aww, but thanks. Laurie's is really good because it's very to the point and it's very well organized and it's, it's like valuable. I recommend it even to other organizers that are just starting. And I'm like, if you just need a framework for how to approach a space, this is really, this is really good, even though it was really meant for a more general audience, right? Yeah. Well, I, thank you for that. I appreciate that. And it always means a little extra something special when it comes from somebody who's in the space, right? Because, you know, you're looking at it through a, a discerning eye. Um, but really the story kind of behind it was, you know, I wanted to be able to provide a practical resource for people. And there's a lot of organizing books out there, right? I mean, I've read a lot of them. I know that there's tons of them out there. And for me, I, the way that I kind of built my business practice in general, if anybody's listened to my show or, or knows anything about me, my big thing is I like to believe, I like to get to the root of the clutter, right? When I talk about clutter, it's really kind of getting to the root of it. Um, because I think we could talk all day about strategies. We can talk all day about solutions. But until you really identify kind of where the root of your problem is, you're never, it's only just really putting a Band-Aid on it. And so that's just how I've approached business with my clients. And when I you know, talk to other professional organizers. And I'm not saying my way is the right way or the only way, because clearly it's not. But I think that for me, it's how I differentiated myself in the marketplace was that was really my focus. And so when I wrote the book, I wanted to break it down into sections that were just easy, manageable chunks. So I structured it so that the first section was all just dedicated to clutter, defining it. What is clutter? Because it's not just the physical stuff that you see. It's the stuff that holds you back emotionally. It's being overscheduled with calendar stuff and activities, whether it's for your kids or just volunteer stuff or whatever. So let's just even identify what that clutter is and what that looks like. And then the next part is how do you deal with it? Okay, what are, so now we've identified it, which is step one. Okay, now what? So now you know it. So what do you do with that information? So talking about some general practices, because again, I don't believe in a one size fits all approach. I think everything has to be, make sense for you and your lifestyle and what's going to resonate with you. Um, so we talk about some different solutions. And then the third part is organizing room by room. And it just kind of gives a snapshot. And I always say the first two, I, I encourage people to read section one and two 
in its entirety. And then section three, you can pop around. So if you live in an apartment, you don't need to read the section on garages. Or if you are you know, a, a single professional, you don't need to read something about playrooms because it's not going to apply to you. So I think, you know, the third section is just here are some specific, um, s specific solutions geared towards these, pa these spaces. Um, I always say it's a quick read. I don't want this to be something it's, you know, it's, it's not the gospel. It's not the Bible. It should be fun, lighthearted, and just, um, you know, something that people could reference back to if they need. And, and, the, and the other thing was for, you know, I know that a lot of the people that are probably listening to your show are, are entrepreneurs and may be thinking about writing a book themselves. Um, I, I personally, I went back and forth a lot about how to publish this book, how to get it out there. And I know this isn't a podcast talking about the book, but I just want to say, like, for me, I went up going the self-publishing route. And I did it primarily because it was important for me to be, be able to maintain the, in, my intellectual property. It was more important for me to be able to say, I want to say this message the way that I want to say it. And I wanted to be able to get it out and use it as a resource. Um, as much as I would love to be a New York Times bestseller, because who wouldn't be? I don't really think that that's my end goal. My end goal is to be able to provide my audience with actionable solutions that they can incorporate. And so it was more important for me to get the content out there than sit on it. And I sat on my book for a long time um, because I was, you know, had lots of self-doubt. Is this something that I want to put out there? Is it not? But at the end of the day, I had a conversation with myself and saying, whether I serve one person or I serve a million people, I think that the, there's a value in this content. And so it's important to get it out there. So if there's anybody out there listening that is thinking about writing a book about whatever, I encourage you to do it and just stay true to what you, the reason why you're writing that book. So what is your next book going to be about? Entrepreneurship? Oh, oh, business? Okay. Well, I'm sure you can't say. I, I, but. I'm not going to say, but I will tell you <laughs> offline because I do. Oh, I do have. Yes, I do have something, and it's not. It's it is still within the organizing realm, but it speaks both to entrepreneurs and to clutter. So I love it's that. A little hybrid. Ooh, that makes me really excited. That's right up my alley. Yes, I've noticed you have um, a series on your podcast that is geared towards entrepreneurship. Yes. Is that right? Okay. Yes. No, no, you're, you're totally right. Um, so when I, again, when I started the podcast, it was really with the intent of serving people and giving them organizing tips and strategies and having guests on that either have a product or service to, you know, help you with your daily life. And that's still true. But because like I said, I started you know, incorporating this audience of other entrepreneurs, I was getting asked questions about building your brand offline. You know, I was getting questions offline about how to build your brand. So I decided to just launch a mini series um, called This Entrepreneur's Life. And I had, it was an eight episode series and you could just go right to my website and binge it. And we ran it as actually as bonus episodes right off of the same feed of this organized life um, because we really wanted to make it easy and just attract our our existing audience that were already subscribed to our show and that way for people that were interested in the content could easily just consume it um, and if they weren't they didn't have to listen to it and they still had their regular regularly scheduled programming um, but we launched season one um, in january and we're probably going to be working on season two in this coming summer when my schedule permits. And it's really giving entrepreneurs some basics. And there's tons of business podcasts out there, of course. I mean, I listen to many of them. But I've had guests on about um, streamlining business practices, whether it's email marketing or hiring a business attorney or um, social media, hiring a virtual assistant. So there's a lot of different um, 
kind of checkpoints that we touch upon, but we just wanted to do it as a launch to see if people were interested in it, and they seem that they were. And so we are going to be in the talks of, you know, we're in the talks of season two. That sounds amazing. I love how you have so many different things going on within your platform. You have something else called Clutter Clinic. Tell us what that is. So the Clutter Clinic's really an extension of of the partner. Well, it's no, it's actually an extension. I should let me take that back. It's actually an extension of my business. So one of the things as an organizer when I was just growing purely my organizing business that I wanted to do is I wanted to diversify my service offerings, um, which I think anybody who's an entrepreneur, regardless of your field, understands the value in having diverse revenue streams. Because if you have all your eggs in one basket and that particular, you know, whether you go through a recession or, or there's a shift in the market, you don't want to just be reliant solely on one, on one revenue stream. And I happen to enjoy speaking and it's something that I I like to do, and I decided that I knew that I couldn't always be out there um, pitching businesses on hiring me to come speak because I was out in the field organizing with other clients. So I developed a speaker program that I produced myself, and I started to market it, and I called it the Clutter Clinic, and it was a way, it was a hybrid way for me, again, because I like hybrids, as you do. Um, I had a large following of people that followed me on social media, read my blog, you know, subscribed to my newsletter. But for whatever reason, they were not going to convert to become a client. Whether they didn't have the financial resources to hire a professional organizer, they had too much embarrassment or shame. Not that they, not that anybody needs to, but people inflict it on themselves. Or maybe they just felt like I should be able to do this myself. So I had this large following of people that I knew I could never convert in a traditional sense. But I knew that there was a value and they were interested in the content I was consuming. So, I mean, that I was putting out there. So I decided to come up with a way that I could communicate with them in person by hosting a Lunch and Learn series, sharing some of these tips and actionable strategies, allow them to grab a girlfriend, and for two hours, have lunch, have a glass of wine if they so choose, and learn some specific organizing tips and strategies. And it, in a way, follows sort of, but obviously on a much broader scale, the the outline of the book. You know, we talk about clutter, we talk about strategies, we talk about solutions, but people can also bring their questions. There's a large Q&A, so people can really address their questions. And it's a fraction of the cost of hiring a professional organizer for people that struggle with shame and guilt and embarrassment. It's an, a, certainly a, a much less threatening environment. And it was, again, a way for me to be able to leverage my existing audience without having to spend time pitching my business out to other companies and reaching an audience when I had this community already in my backyard. So really, when I looked at it, I was like, I have this community. How can I serve them? And so that's how the Clutter Clinic was born. And then what happened was when I launched the partner program, a lot of my partners were talking about having, they wanted to incorporate speaking into their business, but they either didn't have the time or really know how to structure a, a presentation, put that together. Because again, they're great at organizing, but they may struggle with some of the other business acumen parts. And so I said, well, why don't we license this? So this could be a speaker program that you could then take, customize it, tweak it to your own branding, your own messaging, and allow you to serve your audience in another way while generating revenue. So that's how it came about. That is brilliant. So is it only open to the ladies in the partner program? It's actually not. It's open. It's obviously specific to the professional organizing industry. Mm -hmm. Um, I, all of our partners, any of the things that we offer, our mentoring, our clutter clinic, we offer obviously a discount to the people that are in our partner program, but the clutter clinic and my mentoring are both other services that I offer to anybody that's in the professional organizing industry that could find value in it. And there's links on the website. So I'm sure at the end, you're going to have show notes of where people of can course. go. So of yes, course. I'll know. But yeah, if you just go to my website, you can find information all about 
um, the clutter clinic and there's a closed Facebook group. So there's always, you, I'm always in there. You can ask questions and, you know, it's great because not only is it the presentation and gives you the slides, but I also allow, I mean, I also include handouts, feedback cards, uh, suggestions on how to market and promote it. Again, some of the areas where people might struggle, because again, if you're an organizer, you probably know how to organize and you're good at that. But maybe some of the other strategic parts you might struggle with. And this is allows it to be a little bit more turnkey for you. Well, I think you're an incredibly brilliant businesswoman for coming up with <laughs> all of these different things going on. Um, and on that note, I want to switch and talk about you okay. for a little bit. Sure. I want to know a little bit more about the, the, the real life of Laurie Palau. Now, so you have a daughter going off to school, um, to college this fall. Like what is life like at this stage where you're not dealing with being, you know, I mean, you, you mentioned being a working mom, but now it's not about little kids. Now it's about helping them transition to adulthood. Yeah. What is that like? Oh my gosh. Well, in some way, it's great, first of all. Like, I actually like big, I, I mean, I like little kids and I like big kids, but um, it's it's completely, your your exhaustion is comes from a different place. It's mm. a lot more <laughs> mental exhaustion, if that makes sense. Like, when your kids are little, you're, you're tired because you're, you're constantly doing dishes and cl picking up toys and just, you know, giving baths and all of, you know, you're feeding these people and wiping butts and all that stuff. You know, it's just physically tiring. Like you collapse at the end of the day. And as they get bigger, you know, I look at this, the season of life that I'm in now, and it's a lot more mental exhaustion where your kids are trying to find their own identity. My girls are 18 and 15 and they're, you know, very independent. And I think that's part of who they are. And it's part of how Josh and I have kind of empowered them to, you know, take ownership of parts of their lives. But there are times where they want to talk or they're struggling with stuff, whether it's peer stuff, friend stuff, college stuff, all the life things that really requires you to be present. I actually feel like I was a better and I know there's all these things like you shouldn't multitask. It's really not good to multitask. I feel like when I, my kids were younger, I was a much better multitasker because I didn't have to necessarily think about the things I was doing. It was like, yeah, I could juggle three things at once. But I feel like I really need to be super present with my kids when they do need me because they don't need me all the time. Does that make sense? It does. So how for you do you transition from – you know, doing all the things into, you know, single focusing on, you know, your child when they need you and being present. Do you it's, have any tricks? It's, it's deliberate. I mean, like it's a discipline. And I think for someone like me, that's a little type A and, and, you know, thrives on structure and routine. It, it bodes well with my personality, but it is something that I have to be disciplined about, like really kind of time blocking in my head whether I'm writing it down or not, knowing like, okay, I'm turning it, I'm turning work off. I'm t putting my phone away. I'm at, at a certain time, you know, like I'm going to go to my daughter's lacrosse game later and I'm not taking my phone out. And then maybe I'll check it later after that. But I will, but I will also in the same token, tell my kids, like if there are certain things that they want me to do something and I know that I have to prioritize or, I, or I'm choosing to prioritize work without guilt, they understand that too. So I think it's trying to realize that you can't be all things at all times and that you have to really just say, this is the best I can do right now and I'm going to focus my time and energy here and then I'm going to put that on the back burner and I'm going to focus my time and energy here as opposed to kind of doing half both, you know, doing them halfway. Do either of your girls have any um, entrepreneurial genes in them? You know, <laughs> me, it's funny. My little one is very creative. She's my artist musician and, but she would need, she would need like an organized, like she needs somebody to run her life because she <laughs> is just a hot mess. Right. So she, Oh, oh she's yeah. such a hot mess. And you know, the poor kid, like I, I 
if you ever listen to my show, like I call her out all the time because she's just, you know, not only is she my ADD kid, but she's just, she's a magical thinker. Everything has feelings. So, you know, that is poetic justice for somebody who's organized where a kid who wants to hold on to like every broken pencil because, you know, it, you know, it needs a friend. <laughs> It's, yeah. it's tiring. Um, and my older one is, a, is much more structured and like me and discipline and just kind of her approach to life. She's my, like my athlete, my, you know, my go-getter, the type A personality, but she's a little bit more of a follower in life. I mean, she leads, like she's like student council and all that, but she, she, she looks to other people's approval more than I do. And I think if you're going to be an entrepreneur, and I don't know, again, I could be generalizing. I, I think you kind of have to just not be afraid of what other people think. And maybe in time, she won't care as much. But I think you have to trust your gut. Because if I listened to people when I was starting my business, I wouldn't have started it. You know, mm -hmm. I started my business in 2009 at the height of the recession. And I was really, I was starting a luxury business. People were, you don't need a professional organizer. Yes, it helps right. you with self-care. Yes, it, 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 there's benefits to it, but let's be honest. You don't need to hire a professional organizer. And people were like, uh, people are losing their jobs. They're not sure what's going to happen and you're starting a business. I'm like, yep, I am. <laughs> and I think if I listened to all the naysayers out there, you know, I probably wouldn't have been here. So just, you know, word of advice to anybody out there listening, you know, if you, if you believe in your messaging, just, just go with it. So it takes a little bit of tough, tough, um, uh, tough skin to even get, get the thing going. Right. I mean, do you agree? A hundred percent. And yeah. I think it's harder nowadays, again, because social media and everybody is, is putting, you know, uh, obviously everybody wants to put their best foot forward. Nobody wants to see the failures or the, you know, the, the things that aren't working. Absolutely. But I, I, I think that there's a lot of distraction that can, you know, draw out a lot of insecurities in people, you know, present company included. And I think you just have to be mindful to, and I, to recognize that, you know, you're looking at a one dimensional or two dimensional picture, you know, you're not looking at, where they're struggling behind the scenes. You don't know what's going on. You don't know how long it's taken them to, to build something, you know? And so, you know, if you, if you can look at people on social media or in your real life and look to them and, and draw positive stuff from it, that's great. But if it's bringing you down, you know, I just did a whole segment on uh, digital clutter and it was, geared towards a lot of it towards social media and you know the negative effects that it can have and again not that I'm hating on social media by any stretch of the imagination but you know I'm not a spark joy person but if you want to use that language you know are these people that are on your social media feed are they sparking joy for you you know are they bringing you down are you looking at somebody and feeling inferior or insecure and if they are then you got to just turn that outside noise off because it's it's going to be there one way or the other and, and it's up to you to decide is this something that I want to you know that I want to let into my life and let into my mind do you have any really good tips for limiting yourself on the amount of time you spend on social media because if you share one I'll share mine Oh my gosh. So people ask me this all the time. Yeah, no, and it's and I'm always trying new things to be honest because I really you know, I question like what did I do with my life before social media? And the majority of my life was spent before there was social media. So like I knew I filled my time. Um I'll be honest with you. I actually have to put my phone like away from me because it's become so innate. So I'll like in the evening, like I will have my phone in a different room um, to just not even be tempted because what'll happen is we'll be watching something and I'll just like glance over and pick it up. And the next thing I know, I'm like <laughs> scrolling through Instagram. So mm -hmm. if I don't physically have it there, I don't miss it. That's a really good what do, tip. What do you do? All right. Here's my thing. I will have an iPhone. And so 
you know, I have, I have all my apps organized into categories. Yes. So it's all on like, folders. I'll scroll through yep. page after page. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I have one folder and it contains Instagram, my email, my text messages, Facebook, and a couple of other random apps that I use for texting. And the name of this folder is it has a bomb emoji. Okay. <laughs> and then it says one time a day. Oh. And the reason why I have this set up this way is it's to remind me <laughs> that if I am on my phone, because I tend to like, if I'm really working and I'm supporting my students or really replying to an email, I would much rather be sitting at my computer so I can actually think and type. So if I'm on my phone, what I tend to do is I tend to click into those apps and just you know, consume, but not really get anything done. Correct. So the bomb and the one time a day is to remind me that I should treat these apps as if I'm running into a building that is like on fire and has a bomb inside it. And then I need to get in, get out as soon as possible. It shouldn't be like I go in, you know, for one thing and then get distracted by the news feed or by somebody's comments or by somebody's, you know, new text message. It's like, do what, you know, get in and get what you came for and then get the hell out of there. So uh, it's working for me. I, like I love it. it. I, that's great. Can I tell you yeah. another? Well, here's what. Yeah. Give me another well, one. Well, this isn't for me. So my Zoe, my older one, she decided, and I will tell you in, in truth, it did not last, but she decided that for Lent, she was going to give up social media. And I was like, oh, nice. really? You're like 18 years old. How are you going <laughs> to communicate with anybody? But she just said it was really more, and, and it was really more Instagram than anything. Like, cause snap, they don't consider Snapchat. I'm not a big Snapchat person, but that's a whole other story. But she was like, I'm going to give up Instagram. And so what she did, cause she's not a big Facebook person, she went into her into the settings in your phone and it you, there's a and this is for everybody it's not like a separate app it's like in your settings in your iPhone and it says you can limit your screen time on a certain app and you can uh, and the minimum is like you can't turn it off entirely but you could set it to like the lowest setting i think is 1 minute a day and then it like shuts off i guess it's more of a parental setting and remember my kids are older so by the time like parental settings like like I didn't have a little kid with an iPhone because it just wasn't a thing mm -hmm. so she set it to one minute a day and she's like yes I could go back in and turn that off but it was like work it was like a three-step process so I would have to really want to undo it and turn it off so she went without it for I think like two full weeks and then she was like I <laughs> and I have to. So it was. It was well, a little was bit like a mini, a mini cleanse. I know, I know. It That's was good. like that, but but I thought it was really cool how you how she kind of set that setting to make it more difficult for her to even access it. That's really smart. That's a good tip. She's a smart one. She is. She's so what will it be like when you have one child in college? And I don't know. I'll have to let home. you know. It's going to be weird. I mean, she's super independent, so I don't, you know, and she drives, so that, I will, that's not like a big to do, I think, um, but I think it's going to be different, you know, I only have two children, so like half of my population of kids is going to be gone, you know, yeah. I have friends who yeah. have like, multi, like, you know, four or five <laughs> kids, whatever, so it's like you lose one, you still have a large, you know, you still have a large network, I'm going to be like losing 50%. Um, but I, I think it's going to be, I mean, we're super excited for her because this is, I think the way things are supposed to be, but it'll be, it'll be definitely a shift. And I know her sister's going to miss her because she picks up a lot of, you know, Zoe picks up a lot of slack for Logan. So Logan's going to mm. be in a hot seat now. So nice. <laughs> so what, um, you know, in your business, you know, all the ideas that you have. I know you have no intention of slowing down anytime soon. What do you do still at this stage of your business journey to, to grow and to learn and to be inspired by new things? So I, I, when I'm, I'm not super social, like out on the weekends and stuff. Like I like to retreat, like I'm a homebody. Mm -hmm. So I really recharge as much as I'm an extrovert and I get my energy from other people. I definitely need time 
to like think, come up with content, come up with ideas, things like that. So I definitely really cherish alone time. I don't get it that often, but now as my kids are getting older, you know, you think I'll probably be getting it a little bit more and more. Um, I also, you know, I, I listen, I like to learn from other people, you know, I think it's really important. And so whether I'm listening to podcasts from other people who I respect and admire, or I'm reading books from other people who I respect and admire, who have done things, and it doesn't have to be in my industry. It's just in life, things where I feel like people are, you know, successful, however you define success and, and, you know, financially is, is only one small piece of it for me. Um, that's how I, I guess, continue to stay fresh. And, and I think ultimately I'm always trying to figure out how can I serve people? What is it that they, what is it that they need? What is it that, what's the value that I can bring? And whether it's to my clients, whether it's to the partners, whether it's to colleagues, like how can I continue to bring value? And I think if you just quiet yourself and listen a little bit, the answers are right there. You know, so like all of these, all the evolution of my business has really come from me listening to what people want and just being able to kind of connect those dots. 100%. What's been the best book or podcast for you in recent memory? So that's a loaded question. Okay. So I'm a big, so right now I'm on this really big Enneagram kick. Oh, interesting. So are you an Enneagram person? You know, I I was just asked that exact question earlier today and I certainly know what it is, but I am more of a Myers-Briggs person. Okay. I love Myers-Briggs. I am going to say, I would like you to read the road back to you. I will. Okay. Leave. I've heard of that. Okay. And then we can, and we can talk. <laughs> okay. We can re, we can, we can reconvene. Um, Cause I think it's really important to not only have this, and I'm a Myers-Briggs person too. I'm also really big into the four tendencies, which was Gretchen Rubin. I just had Gretchen Rubin on my show and we were talking about that. I think understanding not just who you are, but who, who the other people are, in your community are, right? In your life, whether that's your spouse and your kids, whether that's your coworkers, your boss, your clients, your customers, whatever. Um, That's been really eye-opening for me. Um, Not just how I process information and how I deal with situations, but to understand and have a little bit more grace and mercy for people that don't see life the same way I do, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. So that has been something that I've been really kind of devouring recently so and there's a couple podcasts about um about enneagram stuff so um i was listening to that and obviously your podcast because oh thanks Mm -hmm. (laughs) so on that note um you said you you were kind of like my cool big sister which you are so (laughs) what what cool big sister advice do you have for the pro organizer studio podcast um, be authentic, continue to be authentic to who you are, because the people that you want to attract are going to be the, like the people that are going to join Pro Organizer Studio or listen to your podcast and, and read and consume the material that you're putting out there are going to do it because you're striking a chord with them. And there's always going to be people that are going to like it. There's always going to be people that don't. And that really that's not your problem. Your problem is to, you know, your, your goal, my, you know, I think is to, you know, be who you are and use the gifts that you've been given to serve people. And the people that appreciate that are the people that are going to show up. And whether that's 10 people or 10,000 people or 10 million people, you know, you want the authentic people that are going to, that are going to get it. And I think that's really, if people can focus on just staying true to who they are and not lose sight of it with all the other bells and whistles that are out there. I think that's, that's probably my best advice. That's solid advice. You're good. Preach it. You're very wise. Am I? (laughs) Oh yeah. You, you, (laughs) you're a pro. So tell everybody where they can find you online just in case they are not following you yet. Yeah. 
Sure. Um, the probably the best place is you could just shoot over to my website, which is simply be organized, and that's just the letter B, simply be organized, um, and that's where I am all over social. So you can find me there as well. And there's links to all the stuff that we talked about, the book, the podcast, Clutter Clinic, all that is on the website. So awesome. Hit me up there. Oh, girl, thank you so much for joining me today. And, you know, I can't wait to give you a big hug in person. You're going to be down this way, well, like, now that, now much that, more often. I know. <laughs> now that Zoe's going to be going to school in South Carolina, I'm going to have reason to be down there. So I'm super Smart excited girl. for that. Mm, she's going to love it here. She's really going to love oh, it. Oh, I, I have no doubt. We're super excited for her. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me, Laurie. And I can't wait until our next conversation. Thank you for listening to the Pro Organizer Studio podcast. If you'd like to learn more about time-saving services and resources for professional organizers, visit www.proorganizerstudio.com. And if you'd like to get Jen's roadmap to success for launching and growing your professional organizing business, go straight to www.poroadmap.com.